Chapter Four of Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. What vain weathercocks we are! I, who had determined to hold myself independent of all social intercourse, and thanked my stars that at length I had lighted on a spot where it was next to impracticable, I, weak wretch, after maintaining till dusk a struggle with low spirits and solitude, was finally compelled to strike my colours, and under pretence of gaining information concerning the necessities of my establishment, I desired Mrs. Dean, when she brought in supper, to sit down while I ate it, hoping sincerely she would prove a regular gossip, and either rouse me to animation, or lull me to sleep by her talk. "'You have lived here a considerable time,' I commenced. "'Did you not say sixteen years?' Eighteen, sir. I came when the mistress was married, to wait on her. After she died, the master retained me for his housekeeper. Indeed. There ensued a pause. She was not a gossip, I feared, unless about her own affairs, and those could hardly interest me. However, having studied for an interval, with a fist on either knee, and a cloud of meditation over her ruddy countenance, she ejaculated, Ah, oh, times are greatly changed since then. Yes, I remarked. You've seen a good many alterations, I suppose. I have, and troubles too, she said. Oh, I'll turn the talk on my landlord's family, I thought to myself. A good subject to start. And that pretty girl widow, I should like to know her history, whether she be a native of the country, or, as is more probable, an exotic that the surly indigene will not recognise for kin. With this intention I asked Mrs. Dean why Heathcliff let Thrushcross Grange, and preferred living in a situation and residence so much inferior. Is he not rich enough to keep the estate in good order? I inquired. She returned. Rich, sir. He has nobody knows what money and every year it increases. Yes, yes, he's rich enough to live in a finer house than this, but he's very near, close-handed, and, if he had meant to flit to Thrushcross Grange, as soon as he heard of a good tenant, he could not have borne to miss the chance of getting a few hundreds more. It is strange people should be so greedy, when they are alone in the world. He had a son, it seems. Yes, he had one. He is dead. And that young lady, Mrs. Heathcliff, is his widow? Yes. Where did she come from, originally? Why, sir, she's my late master's daughter. Catherine Linton was her maiden name. I nursed her, poor thing. I did wish Mr. Heathcliff would remove here, and then we might have been together again. What? Catherine Linton? I exclaimed, astonished. But a minute's reflection convinced me it was not my ghostly Catherine. Then, I continued, my predecessor's name was Linton. It was. And who is that Earnshaw, Hareton Earnshaw, who lives with Mr. Heathcliff? Are they relations? No, he is the late Mrs. Linton's nephew. The young lady's cousin, then? Yes, and her husband was her cousin also. One on the mother's, the other on the father's side. Heathcliff married Mr. Linton's sister. I see the house at Wuthering Heights has Earnshaw carved over the front door. Are they an old family? Very old, sir, and Hareton is the last of them, as our Miss Cathy is of us, I mean, of the Lintons. Have you been to Wuthering Heights? I beg pardon for asking, but I should like to hear how she is. Mrs. Heathcliff? She looked very well, and very handsome, yet, I think, not very happy. Oh, dear, I don't wonder. And how did you like the master? A rough fellow, rather, Mrs. Dean. Is not that his character? Rough as a saw-edge and hard as windstone. The less you meddle with him, the better. He must have had some ups and downs in life to make him such a churl. Do you know anything of his history? It's a cuckoo, sir. I know all about it, except where he was born, and who were his parents, and how he got his money at first. And Harriton has been cast out like an unfledged dunnock. The unfortunate lad is the only one in all of this parish that does not guess how he has been cheated. Well, Mrs. Dean, it will be a charitable deed to tell me something of my neighbours. I feel I shall not rest if I go to bed, so be good enough to sit and chat an hour. Oh, certainly, sir. I'll just fetch a little sewing, and then I'll sit as long as you please. But you've caught cold, and I saw you shivering, and you must have some gruel to drive it out. The worthy woman bustled off, and I crouched nearer the fire. My head felt hot, and the rest of me chill. Moreover, I was excited almost to a pitch of foolishness, through my nerves and brain. This caused me to feel not uncomfortable, but rather fearful, as I am still, of serious effects from the incidents of today and yesterday. 
She returned presently, bringing a smoking basin and a basket of work, and having placed the former on the hob, drew in her seat, evidently pleased to find me so companionable. Before I came to live here, she commenced, waiting no farther invitation to her story, I was almost always at Wuthering Heights, because my mother had nursed Mr. Hindley Earnshaw, that was Harriton's father, and I got used to playing with the children. I ran errands too, and helped to make hay, and hung about the farm ready for anything that anybody would set me to. One fine summer morning, it was the beginning of harvest, I remember, Mr. Earnshaw, the old master, came downstairs dressed for a journey, and, after he had told Joseph what was to be done during the day, he turned to Hindley and Cathy and me, for I sat eating my porridge with them, and he said, speaking to his son, Now, my bonny man, I'm going to Liverpool to-day. What shall I bring you? You may choose what you like. Only let it be little, for I shall walk there and back, sixty miles each way. That is a long spell. Hindley named a fiddle, and then he asked Miss Cathy, she was hardly six years old, but she could ride any horse in the stable, and she chose a whip. He did not forget me, for he had a kind heart, though he was rather severe sometimes. He promised to bring me a pocketful of apples and pears, and then he kissed his children, said good-bye, and set off. It seemed a long while to us all, the three days of his absence, and often did little Cathy ask when he would be home. Mrs. Earnshaw expected him by supper-time on the third evening, and she put the meal off hour after hour. There were no signs of his coming, however, and at last the children got tired of running down to the gate to look. Then it grew dark. She would have had them to bed, but they begged sadly to be allowed to stay up, and just about eleven o'clock the door-latch was raised quietly, and in stepped the master. He threw himself into a chair, laughing and groaning, and bid them all stand off, for he was nearly killed. He would not have such another walk for the three kingdoms, and at the end of it to be flighted to death, he said, opening his great coat, which he held bundled up in his arms. See here, wife, I was never so beaten with anything in my life. But you must e'en take it as a gift of God, though it's as dark almost as if it came from the devil. We crowded round, and over Miss Cathy's head I had a peep at a dirty, ragged, black-haired child, big enough both to walk and talk. Indeed, its face looked older than Catherine's, yet when it was set on its feet, it only stared round, and repeated over and over again some gibberish that nobody could understand. I was frightened, and Mrs. Earnshaw was ready to fling it out of doors. She did fly up, asking how he could fashion to bring that gypsy brat into the house, when they had their own bairns to feed and fend for, what he meant to do with it, and whether he were mad. The master tried to explain the matter, but he was really half dead with fatigue, and all that I could make out, amongst a scolding, was a tale of his seeing it starving, and houseless, and as good as dumb, in the streets of Liverpool, where he picked it up and inquired for its owner. Not a soul knew to whom it belonged, he said, and his money and time being both limited, he thought it better to take it home with him at once, than to run into vain expenses there, because he was determined he would not leave it as he found it. Well, the conclusion was that my mistress grumbled herself calm, and Mr. Earnshaw told me to wash it, and give it clean things, and let it sleep with the children. Hindley and Cathy contented themselves with looking and listening till peace was restored. Then both began searching the father's pockets for the presents he had promised them. The former was a boy of fourteen, but when he drew out what had been a fiddle, crushed to morsels in the greatcoat, he blubbered aloud and Cathy, when she learned the master had lost her whip in attending on the stranger, showed her humour by grinning and spitting at the stupid little thing, earning for her pains a sound blow from her father to teach her cleaner manners. They entirely refused to have it in bed with them, or even in their room, and I had no more sense, so I put it on the landing of the stairs, hoping it might be gone on the morrow. By chance, or else attracted by hearing his voice, it crept into Mr. Earnshaw's door, and there he found it on quitting his chamber. Inquiries were made as to how it got there. I was obliged to confess, and in recompense for my cowardice and inhumanity, was sent out of the house. This was Heathcliff's first introduction to the family. On coming back a few days afterwards, for I did not consider my banishment perpetual, I found they had christened him Heathcliff. It was the name of a son who died in childhood, and it has served him ever since, 
both for Christian and surname. Miss Cathy and he were now very thick, but Hindley hated him, and to say the truth I did the same, and we plagued and went on with him shamefully, for I wasn't reasonable enough to feel my injustice, and the mistress never put in a word on his behalf when she saw him wronged. He seemed a sullen, patient child, hardened perhaps to ill-treatment. He would stand Hindley's blows without winking or shedding a tear, and my pinches moved him only to draw in a breath and open his eyes, as if he had hurt himself by accident and nobody was to blame. This endurance made old Earnshaw furious when he discovered his son persecuting the poor fatherless child, as he called him. He took to Heathcliff strangely, believing all he said, for that matter he said precious little, and generally the truth, and petting him up far above Cathy, who was too mischievous and wayward for a favourite. So, from the very beginning, he bred bad feeling in the house, and, at Mrs. Earnshaw's death, which happened in less than two years after, the young master had learned to regard his father as an oppressor rather than a friend, and Heathcliff as a usurper of his parents' affections and his privileges, and he grew bitter with brooding over these injuries. I sympathised a while, but, when the children fell ill of the measles, and I had to tend to them, and take on me the cares of a woman at once, I changed my idea. Heathcliff was dangerously sick, and while he lay at the worst, he would have me constantly by his pillow. I suppose he felt I did a good deal for him, and he hadn't wit to guess that I was compelled to do it. However, I will say this, he was the quietest child that ever nurse watched over. The difference between him and the others forced me to be less partial. Cathy and her brother harassed me terribly. He was as uncomplaining as a lamb, though hardness, not gentleness, made him give little trouble. He got through, and the doctor affirmed it was in great measure owing to me, and praised me for my care. I was vain of his commendations, and softened towards the being by whose means I earned them. And thus Hindley lost his last ally. Still I couldn't dote on Heathcliff, and I wondered often what my master saw to admire so much in the sullen boy, who never, to my recollection, repaid his indulgence by any sign of gratitude. He was not insolent to his benefactor, he was simply insensible. Though knowing perfectly the hold he had on his heart, and conscious, he had only to speak, and all the house would be obliged to bend to his wishes. As an instance, I remember Mr. Earnshaw once bought a couple of colts at the parish fair, and gave the lads each one. Heathcliff took the handsomest, but it soon fell lame, and when he discovered it, he said to Hindley, "'You must exchange horses with me. I don't like mine, and if you won't I shall tell father of the three thrashings you've given me this week, and show him my arm, which is black to the shoulder.' Hendley put out his tongue, and cuffed him over the ears. "'You'd better do it at once.' He persisted, escaping to the porch. They were in the stable. "'You will have to, and if I speak of these blows you'll get them again with interest.' "'Off, dog!' cried Hindley, threatening him with an iron weight used for weighing potatoes and hay. "'Throw it,' he replied, standing still. "'And then I'll tell how you boasted that you would turn me out of doors as soon as he died, and see whether he will not turn you out directly.' Hindley threw it, hitting him on the breast, and down he fell but staggered up immediately, breathless and white. And, had I not prevented it, he would have gone just so to the master, and got full revenge by letting his condition plead for him, intimating who had caused it. "'Take my coat, gypsy, then.' said young Earnshaw. "'And I pray that he may break your neck. Take him, and be damned, you beggarly interloper, and wheedle my father out of all he has, only afterwards show him what you are, imp of Satan. And take that, I hope he'll kick out your brains.' Heathcliff had gone to loose the beast, and shift it to his own stall. He was passing behind it, when Hindley finished his speech by knocking him under its feet, and without stopping to examine whether his hopes were fulfilled, ran away as fast as he could. I was surprised to witness how coolly the child gathered himself up, and went on with his intention, exchanging saddles and all, and then sitting down on a bundle of hay to overcome the qualm which the violent blow occasioned, before he entered the house. I persuaded him easily to let me lay the blame of his bruises on the horse. He minded little what tale was told, since he had what he wanted. He complained so seldom indeed of such stirs as these, that I really thought him not vindictive. I was deceived completely, as you will hear. End of chapter 4
In the course of time Mr. Earnshaw began to fail. He had been active and healthy, yet his strength left him suddenly, and when he was confined to the chimney-corner he grew grievously irritable. A nothing vexed him, and suspected slights of his authority nearly threw him into fits. This was especially to be remarked if any one attempted to impose upon or domineer over his favourite. He was painfully jealous lest a word should be spoken amiss to him, seeming to have got into his head the notion that, because he liked Heathcliff, all hated and longed to do him an ill turn. It was a disadvantage to the lad, for the kinder among us did not wish to fret the master, so we humoured his partiality, and that humouring was rich nourishment to the child's pride and black tempers. Still it became in a manner necessary, twice or thrice, Hindley's manifestation of scorn, while his father was near, roused the old man to a fury. He seized his stick to strike him, and shook with rage that he could not do it. At last, our curate, we had a curate then, who made the living answer by teaching the little Lintons and Earnshaws, and farming his bit of land himself, advised that the young man should be sent to college. And Mr. Earnshaw agreed, though with a heavy spirit, for he said, Hindley was nout, and would never thrive as where he wandered. I hoped heartily we should have peace now. It hurt me to think the master should be made uncomfortable by his own good deed. I fancied the discontent of age and disease arose from his family disagreements, as he would have it that it did. Really, you know, sir, it was in his sinking frame. We might have got on tolerably, notwithstanding, but for two people, Miss Cathy and Joseph the servant. You saw him, I dare say, up yonder. He was, and is yet most likely, the wearisomest self-righteous Pharisee that ever ransacked a Bible to wreck the promises to himself and fling the curses to his neighbours. By his knack of sermonising and pious discoursing, he contrived to make a great impression on Mr. Earnshaw. And the more feeble the master became, the more influence he gained. He was relentless in worrying him about his soul's concerns, and about ruling his children rigidly. He encouraged him to regard Hindley as a reprobate, and, night after night, he regularly grumbled out a long string of tales against Heathcliff and Catherine, always minding to flatter Earnshaw's weakness by heaping the heaviest blame on the latter. Certainly she had ways with her such as I never saw a child take up before, and she put all of us past our patience fifty times and oftener in a day. From the hour she came downstairs till the hour she went to bed, we had not a minute's security that she wouldn't be in mischief. Her spirits were always at high water mark, her tongue always going, singing, laughing, and plaguing everybody who would not do the same. A wild, wicked slip she was. But she had the bonniest eye, the sweetest smile, and lightest foot in the parish, and, after all, I believe she meant no harm, for when once she made you cry in good earnest, it seldom happened that she would not keep you company, and oblige you to be quiet that you might comfort her. She was much too fond of Heathcliff. The greatest punishment we could invent for her was to keep her separate from him. Yet she got chided more than any of us on his account. In play she liked exceedingly to act the little mistress, using her hands freely and commanding her companions. She did so to me, but I would not bear slapping and ordering, and so I let her know. Now Mr. Earnshaw did not understand jokes from his children. He had always been strict and grave with them, and Catherine, on her part, had no idea why her father should be crosser and less patient in his ailing condition than he was in his prime. His peevish reproofs wakened in her a naughty delight to provoke him. She was never so happy as when we were all scolding her at once, and she, defying us with her bold, saucy look, and her ready words, turning Joseph's religious curses into ridicule, baiting me, and doing just what her father hated most, showing how her pretended insolence, which he thought real, had more power over Heathcliff than his kindness, how the boy could do her bidding in anything, and his only when it suited his own inclination. After behaving as badly as possible all day, she sometimes came fondling to make it up at night. "'Nay, Cathy,' the old man would say, "'I cannot love thee. Thou art worse than thy brother.' Go say thy prayers, child, and ask God's pardon. I doubt thy mother and I must rue that we ever reared thee. That made her cry at first, and then, being repulsed continually, hardened her, and she laughed if I told her to say she was sorry for her faults, 
and begged to be forgiven. But the hour came at last that ended Mr. Earnshaw's troubles on earth. He died quietly in his chair one October evening, seated by the fireside. A high wind blustered round the house and roared in the chimney. It sounded wild and stormy, yet it was not cold, and we were all together. I, a little removed from the hearth, busy at my knitting, and Joseph reading his Bible near the table, for the servants generally sat in the house then, after their work was done. Miss Cathy had been sick, and that made her still. She leant against her father's knee, and Heathcliff was lying on the floor with his head in her lap. I remember the master, before he fell into a doze, stroking her bonny hair. It pleased him rarely to see her gentle, and saying, Why canst thou not always be a good lass, Cathy? And she turned her face up to his, and laughed, and answered, Why cannot you always be a good man, father? But as soon as she saw him vexed again, she kissed his hand, and said she would sing him to sleep. She began singing very low, till his fingers dropped from hers, and his head sank on his breast. Then I told her to hush and not stir, for fear she should wake him. We all kept as mute as mice a full half-hour, and should have done so longer, only Joseph, having finished his chapter, got up and said that he must rouse the master for prayers and bed. He stepped forward and called him by name and touched his shoulder, but he would not move. So he took the candle and looked at him. I thought there was something wrong as he set down the light, and seizing the children each by an arm, whispered to them, Frame upstairs, and make little din. They might pray alone that evening. He had summat to do. I shall bid father good night first, said Catherine, putting her arms round his neck before we could hinder her. The poor thing discovered her loss directly. She screamed out, Oh, he's dead, Heathcliff, he's dead! And they both set up a heart-breaking cry. I joined my wail to theirs, loud and bitter, but Joseph asked what we could be thinking of to roar in that way over a saint in heaven. He told me to put on my cloak and run to Gimmerton for the doctor and the parson. I could not guess the use that either would be of then. However, I went, through wind and rain, and brought one, the doctor, back with me. The other said he would come in the morning. Leaving Joseph to explain matters, I ran to the children's room. Their door was ajar. I saw they had never lain down, though it was past midnight, but they were calmer, and did not need me to console them. The little souls were comforting each other with better thoughts than I could have hit on. No person in the world ever pictured heaven so beautifully as they did, in their innocent talk, and, while I sobbed and listened, I could not help wishing we were all there, safe together. End of chapter 5 Mr. Hindley came home to the funeral, and, a thing that amazed us, and set the neighbours gossiping right and left, he brought a wife with him. What she was, and where she was born, he never informed us. Probably she had neither money nor name to recommend her, or he would scarcely have kept the union from his father. She was not one that would have disturbed the house much on her own account. Every object she saw, the moment she crossed the threshold, appeared to delight her and every circumstance that took place about her, except the preparing for the burial and the presence of the mourners. I thought she was half silly, from her behaviour while that went on. She ran into her chamber and made me come with her, though I should have been dressing the children, and there she sat shivering and clasping her hands, and asking repeatedly, Are they gone yet? Then she began describing with hysterical emotion the effect it produced on her to see black, and started, and trembled, and at last, fell a-weeping, and when I asked what was the matter, answered she didn't know, but she felt so afraid of dying. I imagined her as little likely to die as myself. She was rather thin, but young, and fresh-complexioned, and her eyes sparkled as bright as diamonds. I did remark, to be sure, that mounting the stairs made her breathe very quick, that the least sudden noise set her all in a quiver, and that she coughed troublesomely sometimes but I knew nothing of what these symptoms portended, and had no impulse to sympathise with her. We don't in general take to foreigners here, Mr. Lockwood, unless they take to us first. Young Earnshaw was altered considerably in the three years of his absence. He had grown sparer, 
and lost his colour, and spoke and dressed quite differently. And on the very day of his return he told Joseph and me we must thenceforth quarter ourselves in the back kitchen, and leave the house for him. Indeed, he would have carpeted and papered a small spare room for a parlour, but his wife expressed such pleasure at the white floor and huge glowing fireplace, at the pewter dishes and elf-case, and dog-kennel, and the wide space there was to move about in where they usually sat, that he thought it unnecessary to her comfort, and so dropped the intention. She expressed pleasure, too, at finding a sister among her new acquaintance, and she prattled to Catherine, and kissed her, and ran about with her, and gave her quantities of presents at the beginning. Her affection tired very soon, however, and when she grew peevish, Hindley became tyrannical. A few words from her, evincing a dislike to Heathcliff, were enough to rouse in him all his old hatred of the boy. He drove him from their company to the servants, deprived him of the instructions of the curate, and insisted that he should labour out of doors instead, compelling him to do so as hard as any other lad on the farm. Heathcliff bore his degradation pretty well at first, because Cathy taught him what she learnt, and worked or played with him in the fields. They both promised fair to grow up as rude as savages, the young master being entirely negligent how they behaved, and what they did, so they kept clear of him. He would not have even seen after their going to church on Sundays, only Joseph and the curate reprimanded his carelessness when they absented themselves, and that reminded him to order Heathcliff a flogging, and Catherine a fast from dinner or supper. But it was one of their chief amusements to run away to the moors in the morning and remain there all day, and the after-punishment grew a mere thing to laugh at. The curate might set as many chapters as he pleased for Catherine to get by heart, and Joseph might thrash Heathcliff till his arm ached. They forgot everything the minute they were together again, at least the minute they had contrived some naughty plan of revenge, and many a time I've cried to myself to watch them growing more reckless daily, and I not daring to speak a syllable, for fear of losing the small power I still retained over the unfriended creatures. One Sunday evening it chanced that they were banished from the sitting-room, for making a noise or a light offence of the kind, and when I went to call them for supper I could discover them nowhere. We searched the house above and below, and the yard and stables. They were invisible, and at last Hindley, in a passion, told us to bolt the doors, and swore nobody should let them in that night. The household went to bed, and I, too, anxious to lie down, opened my lattice and put my head out to hearken, though it rained, determined to admit them in spite of the prohibition, should they return. In a while I distinguished steps coming up the road, and the light of a lantern glimmered through the gate. I threw a shawl over my head, and ran to prevent them from waking Mr. Earnshaw by knocking— there was Heathcliff, by himself. It gave me a start to see him alone. "'Where is Miss Catherine?' I cried hurriedly. "'No accident, I hope.' "'At Thrushcross Grange,' he answered. "'And I would have been there too, but they had not the manners to ask me to stay.' "'Well, you will catch it,' I said. "'You'll never be content till you're sent about your business. What in the world led you wandering to Thrushcross Grange?' "'Let me get off my wet clothes, and I'll tell you all about it, Nelly,' he replied. I bid him beware of rousing the master, and while he undressed and I waited to put out the candle, he continued. Cathy and I escaped from the wash-house to have a ramble at liberty, and getting a glimpse of the Grange lights we thought we would just go and see whether the Lintons passed their Sunday evenings standing shivering in corners, while their father and mother sat eating and drinking and singing and laughing and burning their eyes out before the fire. Do you think they do? or reading sermons and being catechized by their manservant, and set to learn a column of scripture names if they don't answer properly? Probably not, I responded. They are good children, no doubt, and don't deserve the treatment you receive for your bad conduct. Don't cant, Nelly, he said. Nonsense. We ran from the top of the heights to the park without stopping, Catherine completely beaten in the race because she was barefoot. You'll have to seek for her shoes in the bog tomorrow. We crept through a broken hedge, groped our way up the path, and planted ourselves on a flower-plot under the drawing-room window. The light came from thence. They had not put up the shutters, and the curtains were only half closed. Both of us were able to look in by standing on the basement and clinging to the ledge, and we saw, ah, it was beautiful, a splendid place carpeted with crimson and crimson-covered chairs and tables and a pure white ceiling bordered by gold 
a shower of glass drops hanging in silver chains from the centre and shimmering with little soft tapers old mr and mrs linton were not there edgar and his sisters had it entirely to themselves shouldn't they have been happy we should have thought ourselves in heaven and now guess what your good children were doing isabella i believe she is eleven a year younger than cathy lay screaming at the farther end of the room shrieking as if witches were running red-hot needles into her edgar stood on the hearth weeping silently and in the middle of the table sat a little dog shaking its paw and yelping which from their mutual accusations we understood they had nearly pulled in two between them the idiots that was their pleasure to quarrel who should hold a heap of warm hair and each begin to cry because both after struggling to get it refused to take it we laughed outright at the petted things we did despise them when would you catch me wishing to have what catherine wanted or find us by ourselves seeking entertainment in yelling and sobbing and rolling on the ground divided by the whole room i'd not exchange for a thousand lives my condition here for edgar linton's at thrushcross grange not if i might have the privilege of flinging joseph off the highest gable and painting the house front with hindley's blood hush hush i interrupted still you have not told me heathcliff how catherine is left behind i told you we laughed he answered the lintons heard us and with one accord they shot like arrows to the door there was silence and then a cry oh mamma mamma oh papa oh mamma come here oh papa oh they really did howl out something in that way we made frightful noises to terrify them still more and then we dropped off the ledge because somebody was drawing the bars and we felt we had better flee i had cathy by the hand and was urging her on when all at once she fell down run heathcliff run she whispered they have let the bulldog loose and he holds me the devil had seized her ankle nelly i heard his abominable snorting she did not yell out no she would have scorned to do it if she had been spitted on the horns of a mad cow i did though i vociferated curses enough to annihilate any fiend in christendom and i got a stone and thrust it between his jaws and tried with all my might to cram it down his throat a beast of a servant came up with a lantern at last shouting keep fast skulker keep fast he changed his note however when he saw skulker's game the dog was throttled off his huge purple tongue hanging half a foot out of his mouth and his pendant lips streaming with bloody slaver the man took cathy up she was sick not from fear i'm certain but from pain he carried her in i followed grumbling execrations and vengeance what pray robert hallooed linton from the entrance skulker has caught a little girl sir he replied and there's a lad here he added making a clutch at me who looks an out and outer very like the robbers were for putting them through the window to open the doors to the gang after all were asleep that they might murder us at their ease hold your tongue you foul-mouthed thief you you shall go to the gallows for this mr linton sir don't lay by your gun no no robert said the old fool the rascals knew that yesterday was my rent day they thought to have me cleverly come in or furnish them a reception there john fasten the chain give skulker some water jenny to be at a magistrate in his stronghold and on the sabbath too where will their insolence stop oh my dear mary look here don't be afraid it is but a boy yet the villain scowls so plainly in his face would it not be kindness to the country to hang him at once before he shows his nature and acts as well as features he pulled me under the chandelier and mrs linton placed her spectacles on her nose and raised her hands in horror the cowardly children crept nearer also isabella lisping frightful thing put him in the cellar papa he is exactly like the son of the fortune teller that stole my tame pheasant isn't he edgar while they examined me cathy came round she heard the last speech and laughed edgar linton after an inquisitive stare collected sufficient wit to recognize her they see us at church you know though we seldom meet them elsewhere that's miss earnshaw he whispered to his mother and look how skulker has been there our foot bleeds miss earnshaw nonsense cried the dame 
Miss Earnshaw is currying the country with a gypsy. And yet, my dear, the child is in mourning, surely it is, and she might be lamed for life. What culpable carelessness in her brother! exclaimed Mr. Linton, turning from me to Catherine. I've understood from Shielders. That was the curate, sir. That he lets her grow up in absolute heathenism. But who is this? Where did she pick up this companion? Oh, I declare he is that strange acquisition my late neighbour made in his journey to Liverpool. A little Lascar, or an American, or Spanish castaway. A wicked boy at all events, remarked the old lady. And quite unfit for a decent house. Did you notice his language, Linton? I'm shocked that my children should have heard it. I recommenced cursing, don't be angry, Nelly, and so Robert was ordered to take me off. I refused to go without Cathy. He dragged me into the garden, pushed the lantern into my hand, assured me that Mr. Earnshaw should be informed of my behavior, and, bidding me march directly, secured the door again. The curtains were still looped up at one corner, and I resumed my station as spy, because if Catherine had wished to return, I intended shattering their great glass panes to a million of fragments unless they let her out. She sat on the sofa quietly. Mrs. Linton took off the grey cloak of the dairymaid, which we had borrowed for our excursion, shaking her head and expostulating with her, I suppose. She was a young lady, and they made a distinction between her treatment and mine. Then the woman-servant brought a basin of warm water and washed her feet, and Mr. Linton mixed a tumbler of negus, and Isabella emptied a plateful of cakes into her lap, and Edgar stood gaping at a distance. Afterwards they dried and combed her beautiful hair, and gave her a pair of enormous slippers, and wheeled her to the fire. And I left her, as merry as she could be, dividing her food between the little dog and skulker, whose nose she pinched as he ate and kindling a spark of spirit in the vacant blue eyes of the lintons a dim reflection from her own enchanting face i saw they were full of stupid admiration she is so immeasurably superior to them to everybody on earth is she not nelly there will more come of this business than you reckon on i answered covering him up and extinguishing the light you are incurable heathcliff and Mr. Hindley will have to proceed to extremities, see if he won't. My words came truer than I desired. The luckless adventure made Earnshaw furious, and then Mr. Linton, to mend matters, paid us a visit himself on the morrow, and read the young master such a lecture on the road he guided his family that he was stirred to look about him in earnest. Heathcliff received no flogging, but he was told that the first word he spoke to Miss Catherine should ensure a dismissal and Mrs. Earnshaw undertook to keep her sister-in-law in due restraint when she returned home, employing art, not force. With force, she would have found it impossible. End of chapter 6《c a t h y stayed at Thrushcross Grange five weeks, till Christmas. By that time her ankle was thoroughly cured, and her manners much improved. The mistress visited her often in the interval, and commenced her plan of reform by trying to raise her self-respect with fine clothes and flattery, which she took to readily, so that, instead of a wild, hatless little savage jumping into the house and rushing to squeeze us all breathless, there lighted from a handsome black pony a very dignified person, with brown ringlets falling from the cover of a feathered beaver, and a long cloth habit, which she was obliged to hold up with both hands, that she might sail in. Hindley lifted her from the horse, exclaiming delightedly, "'Why, Cathy, you are quite a beauty. I should scarcely have known you. You look like a lady now. Isabella Lytton has not to be compared with her, is she, Francis?' "'Isabella has not her natural advantages,' replied his wife. "'But she must mind and not grow wild here. Ellen, help Miss Catherine off with her things. Stay, dear.' You will disarrange your curls. Let me untie your hat. I removed the habit, and there shone forth beneath a grand plaid silk frock, white trousers, and burnished shoes. And, while her eyes sparkled joyfully when the dogs came bounding up to welcome her, she dared hardly touch them, lest they should fawn upon her splendid garments. She kissed me gently. I was all flour making the Christmas cake, and it would not have done to give me a hug. And then she looked round for Heathcliff. 
Mr. and Mrs. Earnshaw watched anxiously their meeting, thinking it would enable them to judge in some measure what ground they had for hoping to succeed in separating the two friends. Heathcliff was hard to discover at first. If he were careless and uncared for before Catherine's absence, he had been ten times more so since. Nobody but I even did him the kindness to call him a dirty boy, and bid him wash himself once a week, and children of his age seldom have a natural pleasure in soap and water. Therefore, not to mention his clothes, which had seen three months' service in mire and dust, and his thick uncombed hair, the surface of his face and hands was dismally beclouded. He might well skulk behind the settle, on beholding such a bright, graceful damsel enter the house, instead of a rough-headed counterpart of himself, as he expected. "'Is Heathcliff not here?' she demanded, pulling off her gloves, and displaying fingers wonderfully whitened with doing nothing and staying indoors. "'Heathcliff, you may come forward,' cried Mr. Hindley, enjoying his discomfiture, and gratified to see what a forbidding young blackguard he would be compelled to present himself. "'You may come and wish Miss Catherine welcome, like the other servants.' Cathy, catching a glimpse of her friend in his concealment, flew to embrace him. She bestowed seven or eight kisses on his cheek within the second, and then stopped, and drawing back, burst into a laugh, exclaiming, "'Why, how very black and cross you look! And how—how how funny and grim! But that's because I'm used to Edgar and Isabella Linton. Well, Heathcliff, have you forgotten me?' She had some reason to put the question, for shame and pride threw double gloom over his countenance, and kept him immovable. "'Shake hands, Heathcliff,' said Mr. Earnshaw, condescendingly. "'Once in a way that is permitted.' "'I shall not,' replied the boy, finding his tongue at last. "'I shall not stand to be laughed at. I shall not bear it.' And he would have broken from the circle, but Miss Cathy seized him again. "'I did not mean to laugh at you,' she said. "'I could not hinder myself. Heathcliff, shake hands at least. What are you sulky for? It was only that you looked odd.' If you wash your face and brush your hair, it will be all right. But you are so dirty. She gazed concernedly at the dusky fingers she held in her own, and also at her dress, which she feared had gained no embellishment from its contact with his. You needn't have touched me, he answered, following her eye and snatching away his hand. I shall be as dirty as I please, and I like to be dirty, and I will be dirty. With that, he dashed head foremost out of the room amid the merriment of the master and mistress, and to the serious disturbance of Catherine, who could not comprehend how her remarks should have produced such an exhibition of bad temper. After playing ladies' maid to the newcomer, and putting my cakes in the oven, and making the house and kitchen cheerful with great fires, befitting Christmas Eve, I prepared to sit down and amuse myself by singing carols, all alone, regardless of Joseph's affirmations that he considered the merry tunes I chose as next door to songs, he had retired to private prayer in his chamber, and Mr. and Mrs. Earnshaw were engaging Missy's attention by sundry gay trifles bought for her to present to the little Lintons as an acknowledgment of their kindness. They had invited them to spend the morrow at Wuthering Heights, and the invitation had been accepted, on one condition. Mrs. Linton begged that her darlings might be kept carefully apart from that naughty swearing boy. Under these circumstances I remained solitary. I smelt the rich scent of the heating spices, and admired the shining kitchen utensils, the polished clock, decked in holly, the silver mugs ranged on a tray ready to be filled with mulled ale for supper, and above all, the speckless purity of my particular care, the scoured and well-swept floor. I gave due inward applause to every object, and then I remembered how old Earnshaw used to come in when all was tidied and call me a cant lass, and slip a shilling into my hand as a Christmas box. And from that I went on to think of his fondness for Heathcliff, and his dread lest he should suffer neglect after death had removed him, and that naturally led me to consider the poor lad's situation now, and from singing I changed my mind to crying. It struck me soon, however, there would be more sense in endeavouring to repair some of his wrongs than shedding tears over them. I got up and walked into the court to see him. He was not far— I found him smoothing the glossy coat of the new pony in the stable, and feeding the other beasts, according to custom. "'Make haste, Heathcliff,' I said. "'The kitchen is so comfortable, and Joseph is upstairs. Make haste, and let me dress you smart before Miss Cathy comes out. 
and then you can sit together, with the whole hearth to yourselves, and have a long chatter till bedtime. He proceeded with his task, and never turned his head towards me. Come, are you coming? I continued. There's a little cake for each of you, nearly enough, and you'll need half an hour's donning. I waited five minutes, but getting no answer left him. Catherine supped with her brother and sister-in-law. Joseph and I joined at an unsociable meal, seasoned with reproofs on one side and sauciness on the other. His cake and cheese remained on the table all night for the fairies. He managed to continue work till nine o'clock, and then marched a dumb and dour to his chamber. Cathy set up late, having a world of things to order for the reception of her new friends. She came into the kitchen once to speak to her old one, but he was gone, and she only stayed to ask what was the matter with him, and then went back. In the morning he rose early, and, as it was a holiday, carried his ill humour on to the moors, not reappearing till the family were departed for church. Fasting and reflection seemed to have brought him to a better spirit. He hung about me for a while, and having screwed up his courage, exclaimed abruptly, Nelly, make me decent. I'm going to be good. High time, Heathcliff, I said. You have grieved Catherine. She's sorry she ever came home, I dare say. It looks as if you envied her, because she is more thought of than you. The notion of envying Catherine was incomprehensible to him, but the notion of grieving her he understood clearly enough. Did she say she was grieved? he inquired, looking very serious. She cried when I told her you were off again this morning. Well, I cried last night, he returned. And I had more reason to cry than she. Yes, you had the reason of going to bed with a proud heart and an empty stomach, said I. Proud people breed sad sorrows for themselves. But if you be ashamed of your touchiness, you must ask pardon, mind, when she comes in. You must go up and offer to kiss her and say, you know best what to say, only do it heartily, and not as if you thought her converted into a stranger by her grand dress. And now, though I have dinner to get ready, I'll steal time to arrange you so that Edgar Linton shall look quite a doll beside you, and that he does. You are younger, and yet, I'll be bound, you are taller and twice as broad across the shoulders. You could knock him down in a twinkling. Don't you feel that you could? Heathcliff's face brightened a moment. Then it was overcast afresh, and he sighed. But, Nelly, if I knocked him down twenty times, that wouldn't make him less handsome or me more so. I wish I had light hair and a fair skin and was dressed and behaved as well, and had a chance of being as rich as he will be. And cried for Mamma at every turn, I added, and trembled if a country lad heaved his fist against you, and sat at home all day for a shower of rain. Oh, Heathcliff, you are showing a poor spirit. Come to the glass, and I'll let you see what you should wish. Do you mark those two lines between your eyes, and those thick brows, that, instead of rising arched, sink in the middle, and that couple of black fiends so deeply buried, who never open their windows boldly but lurk glinting under them, like devil's spies? Wish and learn to smooth away the surly wrinkles, to raise your lids frankly, and change the fiends to confident, innocent angels, suspecting and doubting nothing, and always seeing friends where they are not sure of foes. Don't get the expression of a vicious cur that appears to know the kicks it gets are its desert, and yet hates all the world, as well as the kicker, for what it suffers. In other words, I must wish for Edgar Linton's great blue eyes and even forehead, he replied. I do, and that won't help me to them. A good heart will help you to a bonny face, my lad, I continued, if you were a regular black, and a bad one will turn the bonniest into something worse than ugly. And now that we've done washing and combing and sulking, tell me whether you don't think yourself rather handsome. I'll tell you, I do. You're fit for a prince in disguise. Who knows but your father was emperor of China, and your mother an Indian queen, each of them able to buy up with one week's income Wuthering Heights and Thrushcross Grange together. And you were kidnapped by wicked sailors and brought to England. Were I in your place, I would frame high notions of my birth, and the thoughts of what I was should give me courage and dignity to support the oppressions of a little farmer. So I chattered on, and Heathcliff gradually lost his frown and began to look quite pleasant, when all at once our conversation was interrupted by a rumbling sound moving up the road and entering the court. 
He ran to the window and I to the door, just in time to behold the two Lintons descend from the family carriage, smothered in cloaks and furs, and the Earnshaws dismount from their horses. They often rode to church in winter. Catherine took a hand of each of the children, and brought them into the house and set them before the fire, which quickly put colour into their white faces. I urged my companion to hasten now, and show his amiable humour, and he willingly obeyed. But ill luck would have it that, as he opened the door leading from the kitchen on one side, Hindley opened it on the other. They met, and the master, irritated at seeing him clean and cheerful, or, perhaps, eager to keep his promise to Mrs. Linton, shoved him back with a sudden thrust, and angrily bade Joseph. Keep the fellow out of the room. Send him into the garret till dinner's over. He'll be cramming his fingers in the tarts, and stealing the fruit if left alone with them a minute. Nay, sir, I could not avoid answering. He'll touch nothing, not he, and I suppose he must have his share of the dainties as well as we. He shall have his share in my hand if I catch him downstairs till dark, cried Hindley. Be gone, you vagabond. What, are you tempting the coxcomb, are you? Wait till I get hold of those elegant locks. See if I won't pull them a bit longer. They're long enough already, observed Master Linton, peeping from the doorway. I wonder they don't make his head ache. It's like a colt's mane over his eyes. He ventured this remark without any intention to insult, but Heathcliff's violent nature was not prepared to endure the appearance of impertinence from one whom he seemed to hate, even then as a rival. He seized a tureen of hot applesauce, the first thing that came under his grip, and dashed it full against the speaker's face and neck, who instantly commenced a lament that brought Isabella and Catherine hurrying to the place. Mr. Earnshaw snatched up the culprit directly and conveyed him to his chamber, where, doubtless, he administered a rough remedy to cool the fit of passion, for he appeared red and breathless. I got the dishcloth, and rather spitefully scrubbed Edgar's nose and mouth, affirming it to serve him right for meddling. His sister began weeping to go home, and Cathy stood by confounded, blushing for all. "'You should not have spoken to him,' she expostulated with Master Linton. "'He was in a bad temper, and now you've spoilt your visit, and he'll be flogged. I hate him to be flogged. I can't eat my dinner. Why did you speak to him, Edgar?' "'I didn't.' sobbed the youth, escaping from my hands and finishing the remainder of the purification with his cambric pocket-handkerchief. "'I promised Mamma I wouldn't say one word to him, and I didn't.' "'Well, don't cry,' replied Catherine contemptuously. "'You're not killed. Don't make more mischief. My brother is coming. Be quiet. Hush, Isabella. Has anybody hurt you?' "'There, there, children, to your seats,' cried Hindley, bustling in. That brute of a lad has warmed me nicely. Next time, Master Edgar, take the lawn to your own fists. It will give you an appetite. The little party recovered its equanimity at sight of the fragrant feast. They were hungry after their ride, and easily consoled, since no real harm had befallen them. Mr. Earnshaw carved bountiful platefuls, and the mistress made them merry with lively talk. I waited behind her chair, and was pained to behold Catherine, with dry eyes and an indifferent air, commence cutting up the wing of a goose before her. An unfeeling child, I thought to myself, how lightly she dismisses her old playmate's troubles. I could not have imagined her to be so selfish. She lifted a mouthful to her lips, then she set it down again, her cheeks flushed, and the tears gushed over them. She slipped her fork to the floor, and hastily dived under the cloth to conceal her emotion. I did not call her unfeeling long, for I perceived she was in purgatory throughout the day, and wearying to find an opportunity of getting by herself, or paying a visit to Heathcliff, who had been locked up by the master, as I discovered, on endeavouring to introduce to him a private mess of victuals. In the evening we had a dance. Cathy begged that he might be liberated then, as Isabella Linton had no partner. Her entreaties were vain, and I was appointed to supply the deficiency. We got rid of all the gloom in the excitement of the exercise, and our pleasure was increased by the arrival of the Gimmerton band, mustering fifteen strong, a trumpet, a trombone, clarinets, bassoons, French horns, and a bass viol, besides singers. They go the rounds of all the respectable houses, and receive contributions every Christmas, and we esteemed it a first-rate treat to hear them. After the usual carols had been sung, we set them to songs and glees. Mrs. Earnshaw loved the music and so they gave us plenty. Catherine loved it too, 
but she said it sounded sweetest at the top of the steps, and she went up in the dark. I followed. They shut the house door below, never noting our absence. It was so full of people. She made no stay at the stairs' head, but mounted farther, to the garret where Heathcliff was confined, and called him. He stubbornly declined answering for a while. She persevered, and finally persuaded him to hold communion with her through the boards. I let the poor things converse unmolested, till I supposed the songs were going to cease, and the singers to get some refreshment. Then I clambered up the ladder to warn her. Instead of finding her outside, I heard her voice within. The little monkey had crept by the skylight of one garret along the roof, into the skylight of the other, and it was with the utmost difficulty I could coax her out again. When she did come, Heathcliff came with her, and she insisted that I should take him into the kitchen, as my fellow-servant had gone to a neighbour's to be removed from the sound of our devil's psalmody, as it pleased him to call it. I told them I intended by no means to encourage their tricks, but as the prisoner had never broken his fast since yesterday's dinner, I would wink at his cheating Mr. Hindley that once. He went down. I set him a stool by the fire, and offered him a quantity of good things, but he was sick, and could eat little, and my attempts to entertain him were thrown away. He leant his two elbows on his knees, and his chin on his hands, and remained wrapped in dumb meditation. On my inquiring the subject of his thoughts, he answered gravely, I'm trying to settle how I shall pay Hindley back. I don't care how long I wait, if I can only do it at last. I hope he will not die before I do. For shame, Heathcliff, said I. It is for God to punish wicked people. We should learn to forgive. No, God won't have the satisfaction that I shall, he returned. I only wish I knew the best way. Let me alone, and I'll plan it out. While I'm thinking of that, I don't feel pain. But, Mr. Lockwood, I forget these tales cannot divert you. I'm annoyed how I should dream of chattering on at such a rate, and your gruel cold, and you nodding for bed. I could have told Heathcliff's history, all that you need to hear, in half a dozen words. Thus interrupting herself, the housekeeper rose, and proceeded to lay aside her sewing. But I felt incapable of moving from the hearth, and I was very far from nodding. "'Sit still, Mrs. Dean,' I cried. "'Do sit still another half-hour. You have done just right to tell the story leisurely. That is the method I like, and you must finish it in the same style. I am interested in every character you have mentioned, more or less. The clock is on the stroke of eleven, sir. No matter. I am not accustomed to go to bed in the long hours. One or two is early enough for a person who lies till ten. You shouldn't lie till ten. There's the very prime of the morning gone long before that time. A person who has not done one half his day's work by ten o'clock runs a chance of leaving the other half undone. Nevertheless, Mrs. Dean, resume your chair, because tomorrow I intend lengthening the night till afternoon. I prognosticate for myself an obstinate cold, at least. I hope not, sir. Well, you must allow me to leap over some three years. During that space, Mrs. Earnshaw. No, no, I'll allow nothing of the sort. Are you acquainted with the mood of mind in which— if you were seated alone, and the cat licking its kitten on the rug before you, you would watch the operation so intently that Puss's neglect of one ear would put you seriously out of temper? A terribly lazy mood, I should say. On the contrary, a tiresomely active one. It is mine at present, and therefore continue minutely. I perceive that people in these regions acquire over people in towns the value that a spider in a dungeon does over a spider in a cottage to their various occupants and yet the deepened attraction is not entirely owing to the situation of the looker-on. They do live more in earnest, more in themselves, and less in surface, change, and frivolous external things. I could fancy a love for life here almost possible, and I was a fixed unbeliever in any love of a year's standing. One state resembles setting a hungry man down to a single dish, on which he may concentrate his entire appetite and do it justice. The other, introducing him to a table laid out by French cooks, he can perhaps extract as much enjoyment from the hall, but each part is a mere atom in his regard and remembrance. Oh, here we are the same as anywhere else, when you get to know us, observed Mrs. Dean, somewhat puzzled at my speech. Excuse me, I responded. You, my good friend, are a striking evidence against that assertion. Excepting a few provincialisms of slight consequence, you have no marks of the manners which I am habituated to consider as peculiar to your class. I am sure you have thought a great deal more than the generality of servants think. You have been compelled to cultivate your reflective faculties, 
for want of occasions for frittering your life away in silly trifles. Mrs. Dean laughed. I certainly esteem myself a steady, reasonable kind of body, she said, not exactly from living among the hills and seeing one set of faces and one series of actions from year's end to year's end, but I have undergone sharp discipline, which has taught me wisdom, and then I have read more than you would fancy, Mr. Lockwood. You could not open a book in this library that I have not looked into, and got something out of also, unless it be that range of Greek and Latin, and that of French, and those I know one from another. It is as much as you can expect of a poor man's daughter. However, if I am to follow my story in true gossip's fashion, I had better go on. And, instead of leaping three years, I will be content to pass to the next summer, the summer of 1778. That is nearly twenty-three years ago. End of chapter 7